subsequently when we we sold the book it was the it was the publishers who said you know it's a love story and i had never intended to write a love story um because Jake and I have a very real marriage, you know, we have the good parts and the bad parts and the fights and the I love you, I hate you, and, you know, all the stuff that goes on in a marriage. But I think, I genuinely think when you come to the end of it, I do think it's a love story. Hello, everyone. Welcome to the Edinburgh International Book Festival. I'm writer and broadcaster Sam Baker, and I'm thrilled to be here with the award-winning stage and screenwriter, Abby Morgan. Abby's reputation precedes her. Throughout her almost 30-year career, she has written some of our most significant drama, including Shame, Sex Traffic, The Queen, Iron Lady, Suffragette, The Hour, for which she won an Emmy, and most recently, the BBC series, The Split. Her career has been characterized by the vast array of incredible roles she's written for female actors of all ages. You cringing now? I'm not, but I didn't write The Queen. I wish I had. Oh my God, did you not? Peter <laughs> Morgan will That's... be cursing you. <laughs> yeah, we'll just throw the, the other Queen Morgan. in there. Right, yeah, yeah. The other right. Morgan. <laughs> Excellent, great start. <laughs> we are here tonight because of a series of events that forced Abby to take center stage in the drama of her own life. Four years ago, she returned home one lunchtime to find her partner of 20 years, Jacob, collapsed on the bathroom floor. It was the start of a sequence of events that would upend their family forever. And it's the subject of the most extraordinary debut. This is not a pity memoir. And someone just has said to me, unflinching is really overused, but it absolutely is unflinching. But as you will discover, it is not a pity memoir. It's a love story. Now, Abby and I will chat for about 45 minutes, then we'll take audience questions. So if you're watching online, please start posting your questions as soon as you think of them. At the end, if you're in the audience, Abby will be signing in the tent outside. But first, Abby's going to set the scene with a short reading. Am I reading of my work? Or the other reading? <laughs> yes, re do, the, um, do the little thing first. So before you hear from me, you'll hear another great writer. Uh, and this is in solidarity. What was it in Evie's head? Crime or dream? I never found out, but I learned something else. When you go deep inside someone's head, they can feel you in there. That's Salman Rushdie's Midnight's Children in solidarity. <laughs> That's a hard act to follow, I can tell you. Anyway, okay, so. Um, so this is an extract very late in the book. Um, we're very fortunate to have our house in Italy, and this is just me remembering a summer um, before Jacob got ill. I'm not good. I get emotional sometimes. I really try hard not to, so if I do, please, um, <coughs> I will be fine, but I just I do sometimes when I read. Okay, so. Late summer, a few years previously, a good friend one of my favorite producers got married in a little village close to our house in Italy. I was invited to the wedding. Jacob and the children stayed in London. A couple of friends and another woman I didn't know well came to stay, and it became quite a party. The day after the wedding, when we were all a little hungover, I drove everyone down to Bosco Verde. We parked the car under the shady trees where, after being stuffed with baked fish and lethal iced limoncello at the tree-lined restaurant, we walked a few yards to the thin strip of sea beyond. The area is notorious for riptides, and every couple of years, someone drowns, sometimes holidaymakers. As a family, we've swum there often, and on certain days when the tide is frisky, you can feel the pull. Today, we eat and talk and after walk to the deserted beach. It is late September and most of the tourists have gone. The young, muscular Italians and their older counterparts have left their lounges and umbrellas stacked up, deserting southern Italy for waitering in the north or working the ski season in the Italian Alps. We are the only people. Alison and Angus, the friends I'm with, flop onto plastic sun lounges and sleep. But the woman I don't know well has already stripped off and is running into the sea. I call out to her. The red flag is up, and I've told them how dangerous it can be. 
but my words are lost on the breeze, and there is a certain defiance, a certain glorious abandon to her in her halter neck swimsuit that makes her look as though she has stepped off an Agatha Christie set. I watch her dipping in and out of the silvery churning sea, at one point her arms raised back to us far out, her face pressed into the wind, perhaps catching sun rays. It's cold and yet she is undaunted, fearless. The image is made even more extraordinary because on the way here, she has told me the story of the day her brother drowned. Profound and deeply moving, I'm quietly rocked, not least because there is a willfulness to the way she now swims. It is only now I think I understand it. When the gods look down and fuck up your world, when the map you've laid out for your life has been ripped out of your hands, you are left somehow impotent and abandoned, and with the knowledge that the nature of your mortality is not a given, that life is a process of cause and effect, and however much you might sidestep the cracks, stay away from the edge, keep on walking past the open windows, no one can prepare you for the utter shock of the backflip, the left field pitch, the curveball, that knocks all that you are, all that you have known for shit. If it's coming for you, it's coming for you. No point trying to hide from it. They say you should swim across the direction of a current with a riptide. Keep parallel with the shore. If you are able to stand, wade out of the current. Riptides can flow at four to five miles an hour, faster than any Olympic swimmer. Use any breaking waves to help you back to the beach. Let them carry you in. If you need to, catch your breath, relax, and try and float on your back. Some riptide currents recirculate rather than flow out to sea and may bring you back to shore. We got back to shore. Somehow, we got back to shore. What's it like to have everything? The last words Jacob asked me all those months ago, only a few hours before our life changed forever. I don't have everything because you're not well. And it is true. But I nearly had it all. And that all got me, us, through. Our children, our family, both mine and Jacob's, our friends, our colleagues, and nurses and consultants, and carers and therapists, my children's teachers, neighbors, strangers, people I didn't know knew us, people I didn't know even cared. Our dog, they got us through. Because you can try and swim against it, you can try and fight it, but for the most part, you have to swim across the direction of a current when you are far out of your depth. Let it at times take you, pull you, threaten to drown you. Hope that you get the break of a wave or the feel of sand under your feet. And then, if you can, on your knees, on all fours, if you have to, you do everything in your power, everything with the little breath you have left to claw your way back, pull yourself up, until you are lying gasping for air on your back with, you hope, the sun on your face. Can you bear to tell us a bit more about the day the riptide struck your life? Oh, yeah. I mean, I can totally bear. The one thing you have to know about writers is we're all kind of raging narcissists who love to talk about ourselves. Um, <laughs> yeah, I mean, so um, in June 2018, my partner of 18 years, Jacob, um, who he had an underlying condition of MS, relapsing, remitting, but was very high functioning. He's an actor. He'd been in a, a film. He'd been shooting a film that week. Um, he collapsed. I found him collapsed on the bathroom floor uh, with a brain seizure. And so ensued um, a couple of weeks of complete madness as Jake cognitively, physically, psychiatrically unraveled um, until they discovered he developed something called brain on fire, uh, otherwise known as, known as anti-NMDA receptor encephalitis. Um, he was placed in a medically induced coma uh, uh, for nearly seven months. And when he came out of that coma in late January 2018, um, there was great joy because Jake was back, and though we knew we had a long way to go with him, um, there was a feeling, you could see there was a twinkle there. He was tracking, that was exciting for us. Um, and you could hear the gravel of his voice. Um, but what also became apparent is that something fundamentally had changed in Jacob, and the book really captures the next, that period and the next um, two years as, as Jacob goes through his, his recovery, and we try and find our way back to each other. And one of the key elements is that Jacob had developed Capgras delusion. It's a really rare delusion. It's a belief in imposters. Um, and it can be focused on a house. You can go home and discover that your house is no longer your house. It can be focused on a pet. Um, but most often, it's focused on someone you're very close to. And it was focused on me. 
and it took a year to 18 months to prove to Jacob that I was his partner. And so the book is about the, the, the pain and the comedy, of which there was often much comedy, um, of, of that experience, and really about how Jacob and I found our way back to each other and how, as a family, we coped and got through it. There's a, uh, a moment in the book where a friend asks you or says, you know, what's your worst fear? And you say that he'll wake up and won't remember me. How, how did that... What was the moment when you realised he didn't know who you were? Well, I mean, I think I... I, I mean, it took, I, I've got a little film. I did a lot of videoing. I mean, that's the joy of the cell phone now. You know, most of it is of my feet. But um, there was a day, uh, probably a, a, a couple of weeks in, that we were able to take Jacob outside. And we're all there. And, you know, he's holding the dog. And he's in a wheelchair. And it's already exciting. And the family are there. And we're, there's great joy. And I'm filming it. And there's one of two things. One, I'm talking to him like he's a child, which makes me absolutely cringe. Um, but the other thing is, every time I say something, he looks into the camera. And I can see there's a really quizzical look. Um, and I thought, well, he's just grumpy. You know, he's like, he's been in hibernation. Who wouldn't? You know, and I'm annoying. I can often be incredibly annoying. Uh, but it became really apparent and really succinctly, uh, you know, I knew it was definitive was a, uh, on Valentine's Day when I gave him a really red, cheesy heart balloon and thought he'd find it very funny. And what I saw in his face when I tied it on the bed was um, one of absolute discomfort and embarrassment for me. And I kept thinking, God, I'm glad I didn't write a card. Um, and the, the nurse tried to get him to give me a rose and said, give your wife the rose, give your wife a rose. Um, they very sweetly had bought them for everybody. And he said, that's not my wife. And I just knew in that moment. I mean, I think already I was bartering because I was like, well, I'm not actually, officially we're not married, so maybe he meant his girlfriend. But it was then, it was really from that moment. And, and, and I think what was... When something like this happens, it's such a shock. It's such a... I mean, my main th feeling was, my God, it's such a cliché, you know? And a lot of the book is me, really, as a screenwriter, trying to make sense of this. And I kept on thinking, this is such a naff plot turn. I cannot put this in the movie. Um, but it, 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 it became definitive over the next few weeks. And so it, that was when we focused on this notion of Capra and, and that Jacob had this very sort of profound illusion, which they compare to as a religious conversion. And so you can't, if it doesn't change, the theory is if it doesn't change after three months, it's here to stay. And so that's, that really, it's a, it was about us navigating our way through that. And um, what was that? I mean, obviously, Jake was in hospital and he was in rehabilitation and he recognized everyone else in the family. How did that make you feel? I mean, I think it made me every kind of emotion. You know, I was rageful, I was hysterical. Um, my children in the audience, so they can vouch for that. Um, I was, like, incredulous. I, I started to get, you know, I would tell anybody. I mean, the book is often, I know this is what happens. I, you know, I've got ver verbal diarrhea, so I would just grab anyone I knew. So the poor barista at the coffee shop would just, like, I could see he could, couldn't bear it if he could see me coming because I was going to tell him the next instalment. Um, but I was mainly indignant. I was really indignant, I, and I thought, God, and I kept on thinking, you are going to find this so funny when you realize what you've done. You're going to be, I am going to get such mileage out of this. <laughs> um, but, so I think that's the initial reaction. And then, then it becomes creepier. I mean, it was creepy at times. You know, it was kind of Kafkaesque. Um, Jacob, you know, when you, would, when you would ask where Abby Morgan was, because I was Abby and that was Abby Morgan, he would say that, She'd gone away with someone, and she had a new life with someone else. Um, and I don't know if that was a bit of wish fulfillment from his part. I mean, at one point, he, he believed that we were living in... You know, he had an apartment that overlooked Hampstead Heath. We definitely don't have an apartment that overlooks Hampstead Heath. <laughs> um, but, you know, I think he was just trying to make sense of it as well. You know, it's a, it, you know capital delusion is very interesting. It's, it's, a, it's a break between the visual and the emotional so that when someone looks at you, they don't feel anything. And, you, and so much of our, how we identify people is how we feel about them when we look at them. So when Jacob looked at me, he felt nothing. And I think that was the thing that was most profound, was that what I saw in his eyes was that he felt nothing for me. Fortunately, he's a truly wonderful person, and he's one of the most empathetic people I know. And I could see he was trying to make sense of it. And so what he fixed on was that I must be working for the state. Um, which I thought was kind of, of quite plausible because right? he couldn't work out why I was so nice to his children and you know why was I so kind and I was putting in all this work and coming to visit him and then he just said one day and I don't even know who he said it to first 
But he, he fixed on this idea that I must be working for the state. And in a way, that became the greatest gift for us because I went, yeah, no, I am actually. And would you be okay with that if I possibly came home and helped you and the kids, you know, get used to this new life? And he went, yeah, I think that will be all right. I think that will be fine. And so that's really how we played it. So when he came home, was he, he was in hospital about 18 months? Uh, 15 months. 15 yeah, months. In the end. So when he came home, was that still the state of play? Um, well, interestingly, yeah, I mean, very much so, yes. But, you know, there's this fascinating thing where you have to, you know, the, the rehabilitation is also showing Jacob the house again. So we videoed the house and we showed him his house and went, you know, and he, he you know, I toured the house like a kind of, you know, really bad estate agent sort of. And, um, uh, you know, uh, and so, but, so he was getting rehabilitated to the fact that this was his life. He knew everyone else. He knew everybody except me. And so, you know, the, we, we were very fortunate. We've got very supportive family, both mine and Jacob's. And so there was a lot of kind of love and care and, and, and taking Jacob through. Um, but I also, I suppose, the other key thing, which is, and my God, this sounds like a bad read. Do buy the book, because honestly, it's funny. Um, <laughs> was that uh, in, Jacob went into rehab in the, in the March, and in the late April, I started to feel a pain in my breast. And I literally thought, I've just eaten too much Coke. I, I drank so much Coke. You know, I've, um, I've eaten too much chocolate. You know, I've been driving. It must be my seatbelt rubbing me. And it, a, a good girlfriend went to get it checked out, and I got it checked out. And the really... Another bad plot twist, guys, uh, spoiler here, was that I had developed breast cancer. And um, so I had triple negative breast cancer. And the reason why it's significant to Jacob coming home is that I was just starting my treatment. Uh, and I genuinely think that seeing me suddenly become fragile, seeing me suddenly become ill, Jake couldn't quite work out. Something triggered, a feeling triggered in him. And I think he started to reconnect with that feeling. And that was the kind of point where he thought, oh, I, f I feel something for this person. Yeah, I mean, there's a very key moment. We, you know, uh, you know, a lot of looking after Jake was, was feeding him because there's nothing to do with him in the hospital. So poor guy would often have, you know, two lunches, two teas. To everyone who came to visit him would take him out for Kate, including me, um, which we came to pay for later, I can tell you. Um, <laughs> a lot of dieting has gone on since then. But um, we took him out. I took him out one day. For lunch and we were sitting opposite each other um, and I, I was going through chemotherapy at that point so I had no hair and or not much you know certainly a little less than I have now and um, he looked at me and stared at me and I have a really flat back of the head it's a kind of comedy flat head if you look inside it's like <laughs> and Jacob, Jacob and I have always joked that it's because I never got moved in my pram that I was sort of dumped there for hours <laughs> And so he was sitting opposite me, and I just remember he looked at me, and he leant forward, and he put his hand on the back of my head. And he sort of pulled me forward to him, and he went, your head's flat at the back. And I went, yeah. And he went, like Abby Morgan. And I went, yeah, like Abby Morgan. And I think that was when I could see he just went, there was just a little ting. And, um, and you know, and, it, and so it unfolded. I mean, it took a long, long, long time. How did you not go mad. I think I did go mad. I think the book, the book is written by a mad woman. Um, <laughs> but she's also, selling also it got really great well technique. here. <laughs> got a great technique. Um, I think I did go mad, actually. But I think the thing that kept me sane and the thing that I feel so profoundly fortunate about, you know, and, you know, I feel fortunate that I had an amazing children. Teenagers are great. Nobody tells you just how brilliant they are. An amazing family. But what I really had that kept me sane... Um, was my creative mind. And I realized that if I could make sense of it, if I could hold on, if I could do that kind of American thing of finding my narrative, or as Nora Ephron would say, you know, be the hero of your own story, I could not only make sense of it of what was happening, but somehow I could make sense of it to him. Because that was the thing that frightened me most, was that I knew I was Abby Morgan, but the thought that he would never know I was Abby Morgan was really upsetting. And... The book is really a conversation I'm having with myself, but really to Jacob. Um, and I, you know, subsequently when we, we sold the book, it was the, it was the publishers who said, you know, it's a love story. And I had never intended to write a love story. Um, 
because Jake and I have a very real marriage. You know, we have the good parts and the bad parts and the fights and the I love you, I hate you, and, you know, all the stuff that goes on in a marriage. But I think, I genuinely think when you come to the end of it, I do think it's a love story, actually, and I think it was my way of making sense of it. And I felt so grateful that that kind of hypervigilance, which I think is probably at the root of most creative people, was there. And so I always had a very strong voice that was guiding me through and was often going, this is great material. <laughs> oh my gosh, this is going to look so good on the movies. And so I, I, I sort of had that going and I, and, uh, you know, and I come from actors, everything's a story, everything's material. My mum's greatest friend is a novelist. I remember the one thing my mum used to say was that you tell her the most upsetting thing and she'd go, that's interesting. Yeah. And I could hear that voice in myself as well. Oh, so God, yeah. I became, you know, I mean, there's a narcissism again, I guess, but I became interested in the story. And also I became interested in the kind of ecosystem around, um, you know, complex tragedy, I guess. Something that, we, that was tragic, was, that felt like this unfolding tragedy for us. And so the community of people around that as well was very moving to me and I wanted to get it down. So what point in the, sorry to use the word journey, but journey, journey, did you, did the book start? Because you were, what were you working on at the time? So I was working, when Jacob collapsed, I was writing the second series of The Split. And when it was shooting, I was going through my cancer treatment and Jacob was coming home. Um, and then I was just moving into writing the third series of The Split when we moved into lockdown and God. Um, we all thought we had a bad time. <laughs> well, no, but I don't, you know, I mean, this is, you know, things happen like this, you know, it's a sort of bottleneck that everyone suddenly, life suddenly squeezes itself through and you're crammed with event. Um, but actually it was really lockdown as everybody, you know, I, we'd done the sourdough, I'd done the garden, you know, we, I mean, we were very fortunate in many ways because you know, one of the biggest things was the care of Jacob, and no one tells you the NHS is brilliant and broken, and it's brilliant at, at fighting to keep people alive and getting them there, but actually the point when you leave, that's really, really the tough parts. But we, we so, you know, I wrote a lot of very bad films I will not admit to, um, but, you know, I did rewrites and whatever I could to make money because Jacob's care was so expensive, but what it did mean is that we did have this... These, these key workers that were coming in for us. So we had Jacob's carers, and we had the therapists, and we were, had, as a family, we came together. Um, and so we had this kind of, the first lockdown was great, and I think most of us felt like, as, as terrible as it was in the world, we were, it, was, it was summer, and we were going into summer. The second lockdown was much tougher, and that's when I started to write the book. And in my head, I was gonna make this into a play. You know, it was gonna be, it was going to be a, 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 you know, Jacob was going to star in it. Jake's really great on the ukulele, and I was going to give him a ukulele, and he could play in it. Um, but actually, the theatres were closing, and Jacob was far off from being able to ever do that at that point. And so that was when I thought, okay, I need to get this down. So I started to write it. Um, I've always really admired J.K. Rowling's stories of sitting in cafes and writing, and I've always thought, I, you know, I write anywhere, but I don't, I, I thought it was just such a beautiful romantic idea, and I finally got my romantic story, which is the kids would be in bed and I would write it late at night. And it was that sort of, you know, between kind of 11 and, and 3 in the morning period that became this rich, rich time for me to write. Did it in some way kind of help you? Is writing is, in a way, it's, your, it's the way you earn your living, but it's your, also your way of coping. Did it give you in some way give you some, back some sort of control over this incredible, uncontrollable situation. Yeah, but also I genuinely think I was playing detective in my own story, but also in, you know, playing detective um, into our lives together. Because, you know, you, when someone doesn't realize who you are anymore, and then, you know, your mortality and their mortality is really questioned. I think no one, I had these two sort of competing experience in one which was this is very painful this is very difficult the other was oh my god there's only we've only got one life and I've got to that you know it does create this weird survival so there was these sort of two tensions running forward for me and so I think writing was a way to get the story down but also it was me trying to make sense of what was happening you know Isabella Land always says uh you know writing a memoir is an exercise in truth. And I, I read a few books at the beginning and they went, don't make writing therapy. And I kept thinking, don't make it therapy. And I mustn't make it therapy. And 
But I think invariably, you know, if you write anything from the heart, then there is, there is something, there is a catharsis going on it. But yeah, I was definitely writing it to make sense of it and to understand, you know, how did Jake and I get together and why did I fall in love with Jacob and what are we as a family? And, um, you know, I, th you know, we, I always remember that feeling when my children were small that I'd taken the most vulnerable part of myself and given it legs, but also you're suddenly in this club called family and all this pressure on to be family and to look good. And, you know, we know Instagram tells us that, you know, we want to look amazing. And, we, and I hadn't realized, you know, as someone who didn't do social media at that time, I had inadvertently bought into this brand of family. And I guess the other thing is that when something like, like this happens, I didn't realize how humiliated I was going to feel and how ridiculous that humiliation was. But actually, it made me think, this is raw and this is real. And... I will not be humiliated by this. I will try and make sense of it. So that's really how the writing kicked in, I think. It, it's really interesting to me that as a screenwriter, you know, you're used to writing and you're used to being gimlet-eyed about mm. detail. And, you know, if there's one thing, well, this book is many, many wonderful things, but one of the things that it absolutely is gimlet eyed. Mm. How was it bringing that level of detail and attention to your own life? I think, you know, I mean, I have a level of anxiety that always keeps me incredibly hyper vigilant. So, um, and also, I think as writers, you're, you're magpie, you're constantly going, oh my gosh, that's great, oh my gosh, she looks great. You know, you, you mag, and I was magpieing on my own life. I guess the thing that was incredibly liberating is as a screenwriter, you are often. You know, I write something, I write very quickly, I give in, I'm very, I, I rewrite a lot, and I'm very, I like brutal criticism, and so I write, and I'm very fortunate I have a creative team around me that I can write on the Monday and I go into a room on Tuesday, and there will already be seven people going, I love that, I hate that, that's not working. Um, and then that phase happens again when you get on with the director and the director goes, that's not going to work, I'm not going to shoot that, I love that, I hate that, and you have to work out what battles you're going to fight. And then when actors come on, you know, they go, I mean, I've had actors go, I'm not going to say that, I'm going to say that, I'll put that. Notice this is an Irish accent. I'm not going to say that, I'm going to say that, I'm going to put that together, and I won't say that. And I was like, okay. And you often have to um, shape shift all the time. Just being on my own with my laptop and writing straight prose. I mean, my only editor and my only eye on it, really, at the beginning was my sister, who I work with, um, and that was invaluable. But it was just so great not to have anybody telling me or filtering. or It was just liberating. I loved it. Yeah, most writers would absolutely hate that. They are, most writers absolutely hate their own editors, let alone having 35 yeah. people before lunchtime telling you all the things you've done. And I love that in screenplay writing, because actually screenplay writing is all about what you choose to take out. It's about negative space. You know, most of the time, I love screenplays that look lean on the page, but, and, the, and yet that stage direction says it all, that line. And, you know, you know I know a lot of... Uh, producers who just read the middle section. I always read the stage directions, but they have to be quick and they have to embed quickly so I can keep the dialogue, keep the flow of the scene going. Um, so I really love that process of, of, of constantly having to fight because, it, you know, the, the, with the screenplay, it's the muse. I never, and one of the key things I've always, I, I realized really early on, they don't buy you, they buy the screenplay, particularly with screenwriting. I mean, TV is slightly different because TV has become you know, it's a gold rush time, but also in TV, writers have always been gods. But because I came through film, film writing is brutal. You know, you, you do a draft, you think you're, you know, you know, the next Scorsese, you think this is amazing. You walk in, they go, in America, <laughs> nobody ever says no to you in America. They do it when you're out of the room. And so you go in and you go, do you like it? And they go, amazing, I love it, it's great. And I go, okay, I'm looking forward to doing the next draft. You go out again, and the other writer's coming in, you've already been fired. So it's brutal because they buy the script. But um, so you, you're always responding to something. You're always, you know that it's going to be owned. It's like, you, you know, I never know if I'm the birth mother or if I'm the surrogate or what I am, but I'm mainly part of the creative process and I might initiate, but everybody's going to make that film. But with a book, the purity of going and just being you, and I guess because it was my story, I didn't have to sit there thinking, God, you know, this is a revered woman, I can't say that, or, oh, I don't want to upset them. I mean, the most important thing was I didn't upset my family, um, my children. But um, it was very liberating to suddenly just have one, one editor, which was me. I mean, I've heard you say, I think it might have been on Desert Island Discs, 
that as a dramatist, there has to be nowhere you can't go. Mm. But how was applying that principle to your own life? Well, it's funny because it's really interesting actually being so open in my life because I think there's an assumption that you've, you've almost taken away all privacy, but I feel like I'm really private. I mean, I do, I've just started to do social media because of this, but I always filter it through the prism of my work. I don't personally put, you know, I might put one, or, but it's mainly in relation to the book. But, um, but also there's something liberating, and I think there are only words. You know, and as I say in the book, you know, there are no such things as pity memoirs. They're just words on pages, and if they mean something to someone, then they're worth being said. And I think for me, to write something where, you know, it's, it, at times it's humiliating. I mean, the person who comes out worse of it in many ways is me, because I had to be brutal about myself, and because I was fighting to um, make sense of what was happening to me, what was happening to us as a family, what was happening to Jake, but I was also fighting for my sanity. And so um, I guess that became my focus, that became the way, uh, you know, and I, I think it's liberating actually. I mean, I'm not gonna write another memoir. I don't, I hope life will mean I don't need <laughs> to write another memoir. But it, it, I feel so fundamentally grateful that story was my thing. If I'd been an artist, a different kind of artist, I might have painted, I might have danced. But better out than in, as my mother says. And I think there is something true in that. And I want to say to my children, I think the other thing is that when something truly terrifying, because it was very, very frightening, I didn't want my children to be as frightened as I was. So I thought, if I can get on top of it, and somehow if I can share it with other people, then maybe other people can say, yeah, I've gone through that too. And suddenly I didn't feel so alone and I didn't feel so frightened. And really, it's kind of what I do in my, my writing. You know, I, always, I do this thing with screenwriting where when I'm working out whether I want to do a project or not, I wait till I get the dog whistle. And what I, I refer to the dog whistle as, it's when I can hear my ears prick up to something that is only audible to me, but that I know that everyone will hear too. And it's not obvious. And it, um, I'll give you an example. I remember doing a project about a, f a woman who had lost a, a son, and so I met lots of people who had tragically lost family, and there was one woman I met, and she had lost a child in a very brutal, violent way, and she was absolutely amazing, and she now worked for a charity that supported other uh, families who'd gone through such a trauma, and really wonderful, and I thought, God, she's amazing. It's so interesting. She's great. I don't know if I've got a drama here. I don't know what I'm going to write here. And as we went to leave, someone made a really bad joke about the door handle. There was something wrong, pulling, do you pull or push? And we all kind of lamely laughed a little bit, but she laughed so much. I looked and went, oh, you've gone mad once. Oh, you've gone mad. Okay, I get it. And I suddenly thought, yeah, that's what tragedy does to you sometimes. It can take you to a place of madness. You come back to sanity again, but there's madness there. And I looked for the dog whistle, and I guess that's what I try and do in my work. I try and find something that feels important that needs to be said and I guess that was what I was searching for in the book which was mainly um, don't be afraid of don't be afraid of confronting this thing that's happening to you don't be afraid of confronting and believe that there is a story here to be told that is worth being said so I guess that's what I was chasing and how is that because it has had the most amazing reaction the book how how has that felt that it's spoken to people in the way it has. I mean, that's so nice of you to say that, and I will be lying in bed later going, oh my God. <laughs> <laughs> um, I guess, you know, it's very brutal. Screenwriting is very brutal, so when a film, something goes out, you get your viewing figures the next day, and then you get consolidation by the end of the week, and then at the end of the month, and, and you very quickly go, you know, and TV's reviewed and reviewed and reviewed, and people write. Abby Morgan's the crappiest writer I've ever seen. You know, it's there, it's there, it's there. I think it's been interesting with the book. It's been a really slow burn. Um, I think what's been genuinely uh, moving and really, like, touching has been the amount of people who've got in contact who've gone through, you know, it's not necessarily directly related, but they've gone through something profound and said, oh, I read your book last night. I was feeling incredibly low, thanks. Or, and, you know, I, I, you know it's... It, I mean, the other thing that's come out of writing is I've met so many amazing writers, so many revered authors that I'm just so in awe of. So I don't think I'm a naturally a prose writer, but um, it's been really 
great to see it land. And I guess as a family, what's been really important for me is that, and what's really important is that Jacob has started to come on the journey with the book now because, um, you know, I wrote it for him and I don't know if he'll ever read it. Um, but he does know it's out there and he's starting to feel the love of it and starting to feel like part of that, part of the story as well. So that's been a really great part of it as well. I mean, that's one of the things that so many memoirists struggle with is whose story is it? Mm. Who has the right to tell the story? And in this case, you know, it's Jake's story, of course. It's your story, it's your children's story, it's Jake's family's story. Mm. How did you navigate that? I wrestled with it. I wrestled with it, like, whose story is it? And I think about that a lot still. Um, but a little bit like, you know, a little bit like, I was um, in a hotel recently, and I was doing something else, and I looked up and went, what is this film? I know this film. And then I realized it was shame, and I'd written it. <laughs> You've written it. And it was really interesting, because I had five minutes where I watched and went, oh, okay, that's nice. And I, it, it moves beyond me, and I guess with the book, I feel, um, fortunately, our lives have moved on from the book. You know, I mean, the book ends in, the, you know, it basically ends in late 2020, but there's a tiny little kind of epilogue, at, epilogue, I don't know what you call it, a little bit at the end, which brings us up to spring last year. But our lives have moved on a lot from there, and now it feels like it's out in the world as its own thing, and I guess it's still, for me, it's, it's ultimately for Jacob. Um, yeah, it's ultimately for him. So I, I feel that it's, it's our story, and it, I wrote it for him, and it, it's there for him, and he may never read it. And I've said that twice, but the reason why I've said that is that's okay, because it was the act of writing it, and it was, it was, it's been liberating, I guess. So I feel, but I, definitely, I have definitely wrestled with that. Whose story is it? I guess it's mine because I put pen to paper. But it's my, definitely my interpretation of events. But then, as every writer knows, you know, it's always, you know, the fish was that big and it was that big. You know, it, there's always an element of creative expansion. So, I, you know, it is only my version of events. Did you give anybody right a veto or even a peek? Yeah, I gave, yeah, absolutely. I totally did. I gave my children, I gave my family. I asked them to all read it and I asked them to feed back. And interestingly, there were tiny things like, can you just make sure that? My job title is actually that, not that. Or um, I don't think there was that. Can you make sure you just mention him? But there was really, I mean, it was extraordinary, actually. And I, and I think that was, you know, it was also a tribute to how much we ran together and also what, what the digital age does. You know, a lot of how I, that granular kind of writing, it came from the fact that um, so much, I had so much material. I would record things, I would text, I would, I would, we would do a communal WhatsApp, I would email, I would email, the conversations to myself. I would record bits of conversation with Jacob. I would have transcripts from doctors. I had so much resource material. Um, but also, collectively, we'd all got on that journey together. So the main thing I felt was, and it was really great, was that I felt particularly our families said, yeah, I get it. We were there. It's, it's, my my brother-in-law said, it's good, it's the truth. And that meant, that meant a lot to me. So, yeah. That's what you need. That's the thing that you need to hear at that point. Yeah. I think. Um, a little earlier, you were talking about the negative space in screenplays. Mm. Um, and one of the things that really interests me is what a small amount of space your breast cancer takes up mm. in the book. Mm. Why is that? Mm, it's interesting. I think I'm only really processing that. I think it's like if you're running up a hill and you injure your leg, but you've got to get to that top of that hill because you're also... You know, you've got, your, you've, got, you've got your life on your back, and it's not just you. You get to the top of the hill, and you're like, oh, my God, okay. And then you roll yourself down. You get to the bottom, and you're like, okay, we did okay. And then you go, God, my ankle's really hurting now. And I think that's where I feel now. I feel like I'm having a slight delayed reaction to my cancer. I mean, even saying, and let, you know, let's, not to get you depressed about this statistic, but, you know, one or two of us will be affected by cancer at some point in our lives. But just to hear myself say, I have cancer. I mean, when I first gave my sister the book, she went, it's great, but you haven't mentioned your cancer. And I realize I have just slightly done that with it, and I'm just starting to process that. I mean, I definitely, you know, I obsessively look at Instagram sites of, you know, people who've gone through cancer, who are battling cancer, are coupling a feel, or do those amazing, amazing charities. And, and I feel um, humbled and silenced by that because 
and respectful of that because, but nervous of words like warrior and mm. battle and fight because it's like, well, so if you, if you don't survive cancer, you didn't fight hard enough. What I do believe is the drugs work and I felt incredibly lucky um, to have got through it. But I'm processing, I think one of the things I am processing and I'm trying to um, use it as a kind of, what is, what's that palate cleanser that you have before? I'm trying to use it to wake myself oh, up. Is, it's the deadline thing, you know, with the ultimate mortality deadline. Um, you know, I, I don't swear the small stuff and I, I try and use that now as, but I definitely, the biggest thing is how do you, my sense of mortality has changed and I'm trying not to let that pervade my life. I try and use it in a positive way, but it is odd. And again, I guess it's because, and there are some amazing films about cancer, genuinely, you know, there's stars in their eyes, classic. I love that movie, but, um, um, love song, I think she, a uh, uh, love story, I think that, but I, as, again, it, for me, it was another plot twist, which I was like, this just isn't going to make the movie. I'm going to cut this bit right around this bit. Don't want this. Because most of it, I was eating a lot, you know, eating a lot of... I still managed to eat chocolate and, uh, you know, lay on my sofa. But I feel grateful I got through it, I guess. It, it was one spook too many for me. Have you sold the film rights? I have sold the film rights, yeah. I... Very good writer's going to work on the screenplay. <laughs> Brilliant. Uh, <laughs> yeah, I have. I'm, I'm, going to, I'm going to adapt it. I may direct it. I say that when I've drank a glass of wine, <laughs> and then I stop myself, because I just know so many great directors. But yeah, I'm definitely going to adapt it in, in, into screenplay form. Yeah. I mean, there's no way you could have handed it over to another screenwriter, surely. No, I mean, I, th I think the only way I could have done that is in a meta way, but actually I think the... F the, the book is very meta in that way, that it's constantly, there are rewinds, there are moments I'm stepping out from it. And so I'm mainly trying to think about the form. And also, does it have a purpose? Is there a reason for it other than my own indulgence? It has to, it has to, it has to move on. I guess one of the things I'd like to do is move on, a screenplay would move on a bit from the book. Because, you know, there's another whole sort of chapter in, in our lives that I didn't get to write down that, that actually doesn't need a chapter, really, but may need, and it certainly need a, to be a presence in a film if I did it, yeah. I definitely would. And what about stage? Do you, can you see it on stage? Oh, I think people are going to get so bored of it by then. I mean, <laughs> I, I mean, when I originally thought of it, you know, my idea, I had this magical idea of getting Jake on stage and, you know, getting all the friends that would play him and we'd have the therapist and getting out to play the therapist and it just totally, and I get at the end, Jake has an obsession, had an obsession during this period with friends and I wanted him to play, you know, the theme tune of Friends. I mean, it was crazy in my mind. <laughs> but I put that narcissist back in the box and um, I, yeah, I came up the other side and thought, um, uh, I think, it, yeah, I let, let, I'll, I'll see, let, I'll see how it goes as a screenplay. Yeah, I'll see as it goes as a screenplay. Take it from there. Is it, is it daunting, the idea of, you know, seeing this on book? Well, it can't be, actually, if you're thinking of directing I think it has it. to do something. You know, I, I've adapted books and, you know, worked with some amazing novelists, and one of the things that's been most liberating is, is those who understand that it becomes something else. It has to be a, a new form of recreation, and so I suppose that's what I mean, which is it would have to be something bigger than this, you know, or different. It would have to be doing and progressing, I think, beyond the book. Um, and uh, so, yeah, I, I guess that, that would be something I, was, I would sort of have to get my head around. We're going to go to audience questions now. I've got a bazillion more questions, but I'm sure you have some. Um, we'll take one from online now, and do stick your hands up if you've got a question for Abby. One at the back over there, and I'll take the online question first. Um, Kirsty has asked whether Jake and your children have read the book, and you have already answered that. So did Jake get psychological support with Capgra, and was there anything they could do to help? Yeah, I mean... From Vicky. Yeah, I mean, I, I suppose the, the, the end to this is that um, Jacob did start to remember me again. Um, it took about a year to 18 months, and, um, and that he's made this incredible recovery, particularly in the last 
kind of seven, eight months has just rapidly come back. So I think we're all, you know, he's changed. He's got obviously things he's dealing with, but he's amazing. He's here at the festival with us, which is fantastic. And he's enjoying a lot of comedy right now. So, um, yeah, it's good. Okay. And what about the rest of you? Did you get psychological support? Oh, my gosh. I mean, thank, yeah, I'm, I'm a North London cliche. I, I had my therapist in place. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I mean, I had a lot of help. Um, I do see, yeah, I see a therapist. I talk about it. But huge help for my friends and family. Um, <laughs> we did try, we did try, we did try, a, a therapy session as a family, but my kids couldn't stop laughing, and I think I just got, <laughs> it was just, didn't, it wasn't the right time. But, but it, you know, I, I, I think these are the things that make us, and I'm sure it's something that my own children reflect on over time and make sense of, but they've been pretty amazing. They're here in the audience, so I can't say too much, because they'll just hear yeah. <laughs> um, Is there a mic? That's the question at the back. Hi, yeah. Abby. Um, I'm a massive fan, as I'm sure a lot of people are here of the split, which was a masterclass in humiliation. <laughs> You've used that word a lot tonight, but you used a particular phrase, which was ridiculous humiliation. I wondered mm. if you could expand on that, what you meant by that in, as part of your story. Well, I think, you know, one of the things, one of the things I, I hold warmly now is my own ridiculous humiliation that I now see Nobody is so big that they can't f fall. No one is so perfect that they can't... Not that we were perfect, but no one is so... has got it all licked that they can't feel vulnerable. And I think one... You know, it's the Brene Brown power of vulnerability. There is something really powerful in sitting in it and going, you know, I'm at rock bottom here. We are at rock bottom. My, you know, life is in the balance. And so there is... The ridiculous humiliation for me is, is a way of my own... Look at my own ridiculousness I suppose around it and and how much I ran away from that feeling and now I kind of run into it and sort of go it's okay it's okay it's okay to trip up you know the things and this is awful but things that make me laugh most in the world is when people walk into things I mean I'm the lowest common denominator when it comes to comedy but you know banana skins falling over just has me in hysterics you know who's been framed that show love that show and so when that your life does that to you now I see the comedy of it and even and actually the biggest joke of all not to get too dark, the biggest joke in all is we spend our whole life trying to make a perfect life. None of it will last. And that's the sweet, sweet, sweet ending. And I'm trying to see that. You know, I, mortality is something I think about a lot. I've got, you know, I had a very aggressive form of cancer. It's, and, it, you know, and I know the odds and the statistics on it. And so I really, it's, a, it's an active philosophy every day to sort of embrace ridiculous humiliation and to, to kind of go here now and then it will all be gone, and that's okay. This is enough, I keep saying, this is enough. Does that make sense? Yeah. Has anyone else got a question? One here, and then one there. While we're waiting for the mic, tell us where the title came from. Oh, the title came from, um, I mean, several titles. I had a really bad title that everybody has, so I didn't do that, because apparently that's not going to be good on the Google search. But basically, I met Jake at a dinner party. I talk about it in the book. And at the time, I was chasing a pity memoir, and there was a very drunk girl opposite me. I was trying to get the rights for this brilliant book. Um, and there was a very drunk girl, and, and I started to talk about the book. And Jacob, the first time I met him, had also read this book and went, oh, right, yeah, I know that book. And there was a very drunk woman. She went, oh, I can't stand those pity memoirs. And Jake went, I really like them, actually. And that's where the title come, came from. This is not a pity memoir. It's brilliant. Okay. I've got, I've got the mic. You've got the mic. I may not want to answer this, but I just wondered if you'd given any thought or if you've got a wish list of who you would like to play you. Oh, I love this game. I'm, I'm so <laughs> well, glad a, I you don't asked offend. that. I mean, listen, I, I'm going to make it a very big list because I don't want to offend all the brilliant actors I know. Because obviously, goddess, that is Nicola Walker, I love to death. The queen, that is Olivia Coleman. Um, the, um, the, uh, the mad, overstretching ambition of Emily Blunt. She's a natural for me. Um, <laughs> honestly, I, I, you know, I, I think there's an alchemy with actors. I mean, I, I fall in love with every actor I ever work with, and then I stalk them for several weeks and months. <laughs> and they try and get rid of me. Um, so, I, honest, I, I, have, I, I mean, I'm, genuinely, I'm being honest, I have no idea at the moment, because I think... 
But it's a very interesting thing. I mean, I may choose someone who's nothing like me. You know, that might be a different element. But um, any one of those wouldn't be bad. Nicola Walker. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Um, has the, there's one there. Sorry, I was going to ask more or less the same question. Oh, right. Yeah. Away from casting yourself, do you think you're going to have the big responsibility of casting those near and dear to you? Yeah, I've been thinking a lot about that. I mean, I'm literally going to have to go <laughs> get every family member in. We'll be like the mafia sitting in a casting room. <laughs> um, yeah, I'm, I, in a way, that's why I'm looking at different models, actually, and I sometimes think about, is there a way of bleaching people out? Is there a stronger POV that actually I focus on my POV and Jake's POV, and actually, you know, we dial in and dial out, because I think that's where, I, you know, there is an invasion of privacy there, and I want to... So I think when I, I don't... I'm thinking about how I do that at the moment. Yeah, very much so. You'd never be able to have family Christmas again. I know. I mean, unless I can get Meryl... Yeah. Play my mother. Yeah. I got you, Meryl, Mum. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. I'd start work on that now. Yeah, I'd better start you. work on that. Yeah. Uh, so, oh, gosh. Yeah, take that one there first. Then this one, with, and then here. Thank you. I was just going to ask, you're obviously hugely successful and very in demand. How do you choose what other products you do or projects you take part in? What's your kind of criteria? I can tell you about choosing products. I'm really bad. I'm good on choosing products. Um, other projects... I mean, I've very, I never see myself like that, so I genuinely appreciate you saying that. Again, I will be thinking over that line later and going, there was a lady in the audience who said, you're tremendously successful. Um, I, 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 you know, it's all about what I choose not to do. I mean, I, there's a lot, I get lots of very interesting projects, and I get lots who go to other writers, and I think, I want that one. So it's not, um, but I spend most of my time thinking, why do I want to say it? What is it? What it is? So I get some really great projects, but I think I'm not the right writer for it often. I don't have anything I can add to that story. Um, I'm often doing it in counterpoint. You know, I think what often happens as a writer is they go, we're going to send you lots of projects about divorce and, you know, divorce lawyers. And you go, I've done that. I need to do something else now. Um, so, I, yeah, it, it's, it's, it's often because I'm just looking for something that feels different. Or yeah. Have you struggled with being pigeonholed? Um, I think I said five years ago I'm only going to write for women. And I'm just about to do something with a lot of men. But actually that's... I think it's nearly over five years ago, isn't it? So I should... Um, I... I I mean, it's, you know, there's a theory, I think it's changing, but there used to be the thing that um, a woman would do, get her first film in a film festival, and she might get a second film. A man would get his first film in a film festival, and then he'd get Planet of the Apes to direct. And, you know, there is a truth to that. But, um, so I think there is, there, there's definitely been a little bit of that, where I look at male and female crews. But not really, no. I don't feel pigeonholed. Um, I mean, I think there's certainly films where I think, God, I wish I could write that. I mean, I've tried to write, for example, a superhero film. Walked into that office and walked out again. And yeah. um, so, you know, I have ambitions beyond, you know, what's obvious for me. Um, but I don't feel particularly pigeonholed, no. In fact, I worry more about the fact that I do too many different kinds of things. Sometimes I think about the body of work a little bit. But that's just a, late, a latest neurosis which I don't need to share with the group now. I'll <laughs> save that for another time. Um, another online question before we go to the lady with the pink scarf. How do you suggest getting over the sense that your life isn't important enough to write about? I think it's less about whether your life is important or not enough, and it's about finding something truthful in it. I mean, you know, I, and I, that sounds like a platitude. It kind of is, but I, I guess what we're trying to do is write something that is going to resonate and has a truth in it. And... You know, I think it's, it's timely, like it's Proustian. You can do something on a granular level. I have to say, you know, it has its plot twist, this book, but most of it is set in North London. And, you know, it's, it, it, I think you, you, you know, you just... I, I don't think you have to worry about that. And also, you can write outside of yourself. You know, that's why I choose to write Margaret Thatcher or, you know, a sex addict in New York or a group of very glamorous divorce lawyers because I often want to transcend myself. But then I'll also always try and find something in it that feels human and real and... It's the counterpoint. You're trying to find the counterpoint. I always remember I did a show about a murderer, and someone said, you know, he's too much of a monster. You've got to show the other side because there's nothing 
there's no real dynamic here. And I thought there's truth, you know, that's, we want to see, you know, even Hitler was nice to his dogs. You know, we want to see counterpoints. So in the ordinary, there's the extraordinary, and the extraordinary, there's the ordinary. So I think you just have to look for those counterpoints and truth, I guess. Perfect. This one here. Thank you. Um, I'm staggered, I hope I've interpreted this correctly, I'm staggered by the timeline, if I've listened properly, about when your husband was ill and when you were ill, and yet you were still writing the split, which mm. was just astonishing. Um, was there a sense, did you have a sense of treating any of your characters in the subsequent series any different because of what you had or were going through? Absolutely, yeah, absolutely. I mean, I have to say I had, I've got an amazing team around me. Um, you know, I had a script editor who literally sat on the end of my bed. Um, I have to earn the money. It was very expensive when someone gets ill. And I'm really grateful for that, actually, because it really kept me going. I had to write the split, I had to deliver. Those, writers, those actors are very inspiring to write for. But certainly, if plot spoiler for anyone who's not seen the third series, but the, the, the kind of moment that happens at the end of the first episode in the third series, I wanted, I love that character, I love that actor, but I knew that we had to do something that would say, life is not forever. So that's why I put that in. And I always conceived, for example, The Split as a show that was going to be about three. It was always going to be about the shape into the divorce because I wanted to write about the good divorce and I wanted to take the curse out of divorce. You know, having grown up with divorced parents, I wanted to write about the inspirational people I've seen who've gone through something like that. So that was definitely, you know, ideas of mortality and love and losing love is, is absolutely at the heart of that show. Um, and I definitely think this third series has really come out of that, what I've gone through over the last few years, yeah. Thank you. And I think we had, do you still want to ask a question? Yes. One here. And unfortunately the clock is like starting to like flash at me, so this will probably have to be the last one. I was just wondering if Jacob has actually been able to tell his story of the experience to you. Um, I think, what would be the best way to describe it with Jacob? Jacob is all about moving forward. So, but I think he will, and he does, and we do talk a bit about it, but I think the actual experience is really traumatic for him. And also, as he would say, I was asleep through most of it. So genuinely, I think that's what's so interesting for anybody who's ever had anyone in a coma, and you go every day and you read to them, and you let yourself have a day off, because they won't notice. Let yourself have time off, because you have to look after yourself. So that's what I take away. But, um, but I think he will. And he'll be, if we do a film, he's going to be very involved in that. And I was wondering um, how you give yourself permission to tell his story, because obviously you've made yourself vulnerable in it, but you've also shown vulnerability. So uh, when I remember the morning of the launch party and I was going out, Jake wasn't coming, and I said, I feel so nervous today, what have I done? And he went, you've spent your whole life writing about everyone else's truth, you should write your own now. And so I think Jake finally gave me permission. Thank you. Um, unfortunately, we have just gone red. So um, that is all we've got time for, sadly. Abby's like, thank you, God. <laughs> um, just a little reminder that Abby will be signing in the tent outside in just a moment. Um, thank you for such brilliant questions, very high quality audience questions, can I just say. Um, and not a single, it's more of a comment, which is like, Praise be. Um, thank you so much for coming, and please join me in thanking Abby Morgan for being such a generous. Thank you so much.